All right, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Joe Antos. I'm the Wilson H. Taylor Scholar uh, in Healthcare and Retirement Policy at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, I want to welcome uh, everyone uh, to uh, today's discussion of the 2018 Medicare Trustees Report. The Trustees Report was issued yesterday, uh, and uh, we're honored to have uh, Paul Spitalnik, the Chief Actuary uh, for uh, Medicare, uh, to um, uh, cut through the complications and explain uh, uh, what, uh, what we all actually already know, uh, which is that Medicare is in serious financial trouble in the long term, and increasingly the long term is getting, getting closer uh, year by year. Um, <clears throat> this year's report in, in many ways echoes most of the reports that I remember re uh, reading over the last few decades. Uh, the message is, it, it has always been the same, which is that at some point, uh, the program is going to face huge financial challenges unless policymakers take action uh, and unless the health sector finds ways to uh, deliver appropriate care more efficiently to patients. Uh, that, of course, is that latter part is, is important not just for the Medicare program, it's important in general for the health sector. So, so really, the, I think the trustees' report does reflect uh, an awful lot about what's good and what's not so good about uh, what's happening in the, in the health sector in general. Um, uh, interestingly, the trustees, uh, who are in fact policymakers, say that taking action sooner rather than later will allow for more policy options and will give the system and the public more time to adjust to necessary changes. I'm not sure that's a message that every trustee's report has had, but it's certainly absolutely true. And I would hope that the policymakers who made that statement would uh, consider that over the next few years. Um, uh, the, uh, the report, and I, I would especially highlight uh, an accompanying analysis of an illustrative scenario. And I think illustrative, in my mind, uh, uh, means uh, somewhat more realistic in terms of the assumptions that are made. Uh, the, both, of the, both the report and the accompanying analysis uh, bring into focus uh, the dangers of what I call short-term policy making. Uh, these are policies that Congress adopts that produce savings in the near term, but may not be sustainable over the, over the longer term. In particular, the, the uh, illustrative uh, scenario uh, points out that there are uh, or, or, or addresses two particular policies that uh, are uh, problematic. Uh, in the first case, uh, it has to do with physician payments. Uh, a uh, uh, legislation was uh, passed several years ago uh, to replace what was called the sustainable growth rate, which threatened potentially 20 percent, 25 percent payment reductions payment rate reductions uh, to uh, physicians uh, through the Medicare program, uh, replace that, uh, that uh, uh, threat uh, with a, a new system. And, uh, the, but the new system isn't exactly a bed of rose, financial roses for most physicians. Indeed, uh, as the uh, uh, illustrative scenario report says, um, the uh, kinds of payment updates, the, think of them as inflationary increases. We're talking about numbers that generally uh, are below 1% a year. Uh, and we, it's unreasonable to think that, that general inflation will be as low as 1% a year in the future. And of course, we, we all generally accept that, that healthcare inflation rises faster than general inflation. So we're, we're talking about a, 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 a policy that was put into place that uh, look good from a CVO scoring perspective, uh, but over the longer term, uh, it, it seems highly unlikely from a political circumstance now, this is not something the trustees or the actuaries are saying, but from a political uh, standpoint, it seems unlikely to me that uh, politicians will be able to uh, uh, keep that kind of a schedule, even though it's in law. They'll change it. They'll buckle under the obvious and probably reasonable pressure 
coming from the physician community that they, they really can't live with uh, such uh, modest uh, uh, increases given uh, their likely costs of operation uh, rising much more quickly. Uh, the second, uh, the second uh, policy, again, a short-term policy uh, created by the Affordable Care Act uh, is something called uh, productivity adjustments. And basically the idea sounds good uh, uh, only superficially. The idea is that uh, the health sector should uh, uh, find ways to become more productive. That part is correct, no question about that. Uh, but uh, be, be, to generate scorable savings for the Affordable Care Act, uh, obviously you have to have some kind of a formula. And essentially uh, the formula ties uh, payments uh, to productivity <coughs> Uh, I I improvements in the general economy. And, and as the, as the uh, supplementary report uh, points out, economy-wide productivity uh, generally uh, has been uh, uh, measured to grow faster, much faster than, than healthcare uh, productivity, health, health sector productivity. Now there are some measurement issues, but I mean the numbers are kind of interesting. Um, uh, this year, economy-wide productivity is estimated to increase uh, about 1.1% a year over the long term. In contrast, hospital productivity has increased uh, recently uh, by about four-tenths of a percent a year, and uh, the, I guess the projection is essentially zero uh, uh, over the long term. And, and similarly, other, other services at least measured productivity, this is a very difficult issue, but measured productivity uh, simply uh, isn't rising nearly as rapidly as economy-wide productivity. Uh, and yet the payment, uh, payments are gonna be reduced because of that factor. Now the issue is less a measurement issue than it is a feasibility issue. Uh, is it possible for the health sector to find efficiencies uh, that will satisfy this requirement, uh, and then secondarily, will we be able to detect it even if they do? I have my doubts about the second. I have my doubts about the first. In any event, these are serious problems. They are not confined to the Medicare program, uh, and um, it's uh, something that policymakers and the health sector need to deal with in a serious way uh, is, uh, quickly. One other, one other point that I found quite interesting in, uh, 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 numerically is the uh, power of demographics. Uh, the uh, trustees point out uh, that, uh, in essence, they're pointing out that the baby boomer generation has an awful lot of leverage in the Medicare program. Now, as a baby boomer, well, I don't know how I feel about that, but uh, 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 it, it's a very large generation Obviously, the boomers have been uh, reaching age 65 for a few years now, uh, uh, and uh, this massive demographic wave will enter the Medicare program, will leave the labor market, enter the Medicare program uh, over the next, I don't know, 15 years or something like that. Uh, and interesting, to me, an interesting statistic uh, is that the trustees project that total Medicare costs will grow from approximately 3.7% of GDP in 2017 to 5.8% of GDP by 2038, and then increase gradually thereafter to about 6.2% of GDP by 2092. Uh, there may be other factors, but I, I, I see dem demography in there in a big, big way. And again, that, that is a sign of trouble. Uh, that's a sign of, of uh, oncoming fiscal distress. It is the freight train coming at us, uh, maybe not at 90 miles an hour, but fast enough and faster than policymakers tend to react, and faster than I think we often see the health sector reacting to real changes in their circumstances. So it's a really serious uh, uh, problem. Um, anyway, with that very positive note, <laughs> let me introduce the panel. Uh, and uh, uh, I've sort of already introduced Paul Spitalnik, Chief Actuary for uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Uh, he uh, has uh, uh, joined us on, how many years has it been? It's my fifth year here. Fifth year. So, uh, uh, but we're not allowing you to take the fifth. Um, 
Okay, that was, I'm an economist, I can't help it. <laughs> okay. Uh, then uh, the next speaker will be uh, Bob Moffitt, who's a senior fellow at the Heritage Foundation's Center for Health Policy Studies uh, and a, a, a longtime expert, uh, spent many years uh, working on the Medicare program in various aspects, spent a lot of time at HHS back in the 80s. Uh, uh, next speaker is Steve Lieberman. Steve Lieberman is uh, a, a non-resident fellow with the USC Brookings Schaefer Initiative for Health Policy. Uh, 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 but in addition to that, uh, Steve uh, runs his own consulting firm. And before that, he was a uh, senior official at various important places, CBO, uh, OMB, and a bunch of other places in between. Uh, and then finally, Steve Zuckerman who is a senior fellow and vice president for health policy at the Urban Institute. Uh, and uh, uh, <coughs> Steve promises uh, to mix things up a little bit. Uh, and so we're counting on uh, some good conversation. So with that, Paul, if you would uh, take it away, please. Sure, thanks. Thanks, Joe. Um, well, I'm going to walk through uh, some, some slides this morning to uh, provide an overview of the Medicare trustees report that was released yesterday. Um, as Joe mentioned, I'm the chief actuary at CMS. And it is my privilege to represent the uh, 90 or so professionals at the Office of the Actuary that support uh, the Board of Trustees in their important work in evaluating the financial status of the Medicare programs. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through a current snapshot uh, and evolution of the program. I'm going to walk you through the formal evaluation of the financial status of the programs that were um, included in the trustees' reports that were released yesterday. Um, We'll take a broader perspective of the changes in expenditure patterns um, that I think uh, some of the panel members might uh, expand on in, in their discussion. Um, and as uh, Joe alluded to, I mentioned earlier, this is my fifth year um, as, uh, as chief actuary representing um, uh, the CMS in, in our role here. So being that it's a number divisible by five, I thought it was important to take a step back um, and reflect that uh, important milestone um, and to take a look to see how uh, the, uh, f uh, the financial status of the programs have changed over that five-year program. Um, it's a relatively short period of time in, in terms of the context of the evaluation of the, of the programs, but there are significant changes that go through um, th that are reflected each and every year. And so just take a little bit of a step back and see how those, uh, see how the programs have changed in, in the fairly recent past. Um, I'd like to start with this slide because one of the important responsibilities of the uh, trustees reports is to project the financial um, condition of the programs. Um, that projection, it looks out 75 years. And this slide to me highlights how challenging that <coughs> prospect is. We do our best. Um, we uh, apply what we think are the best actuarial and economic um, assumptions to doing so. But if you were to stand in 1977 and try to look just 40 years into the future, um, the likelihood that you would be able to project that pie, um, certainly um, how that's, uh, that pie is distributed, um, and maybe you can get close on you know, the total benefits, but it, it is a, quite a challenge to see how this program um, has evolved over a 40-year period. Um, just to, to kind of take a step back, you could see that um, you know, in 1977, the program was predominantly an inpatient program. Um, it, it covered hospitalizations. Um, as uh, healthcare has evolved, the uh, reliance on uh, hospitalizations of, on inpatient spending has deteriorated over time and has been replaced by many other services. Um, you can see um, now the uh, 2017, the greatest piece of this pie um, are payments to managed care organizations. Um, and obviously managed care organizations uh, uh, cover inpatient services and so if we were to distribute their costs across the different categories, um, they would look a little bit differently. But in terms of where the Medicare dollars go, um, the distributions have changed pretty significantly. Um, and the one thing I'm sure of in the future, <coughs> it will change again um, in ways that we are uncertain of today. Um, and so while these are the best forecasts that we can, uh, we can make um, sitting here today, 
um, and they uh, should be use, useful for policymakers to rely on and to base their um, policy development on. Um, <coughs> the one thing I am certain of is that the program 10, 40, certainly 75 years from now, um, will evolve in ways that we cannot um, imagine today. So this is what the program is. Um, the Medicare is comprised of uh, two fundamental um, trust funds. They are financed very differently. They provide very different benefits. Um, and they cover somewhat <coughs> different populations. Um, the HI trust fund, um, this is the one that uh, is commonly discussed as going broke at some point in the future, um, is financed uh, via payroll taxes. It provides coverage for inpatient hospital care, for skilled nursing, um, and, and some other services. Uh, but this is the one where there is the, effectively the advanced funding, um, or the ability to build up uh, trust fund assets. It's financed by 1.45% of uh, a taxable payroll. So employees and employers each contribute this 1.45%. Um, in addition, uh, high income earners uh, contribute an additional 0.9%. <coughs> Um, and in addition, finally, uh, there are additional revenues uh, that are deposited into the trust fund from the taxation of certain um, OASDI benefits, some Social Security benefits. Um, turning to the uh, SMI, or Supplementary Medical Insurance Program, um, that covers Part B and Part D. Uh, Part B provides um, basically non the medical services that are not provided under HI. So it provides physician services, outpatient services, um, home health, uh, diagnostic labs, and, and the like. Um, and Part D uh, is the program that provides uh, prescription drug benefits on an optional basis to beneficiaries that choose to participate. The financing of these programs are very different <coughs> than uh, the HI Trust Fund. These are financed uh, predominantly through general revenues and through beneficiary premiums. Um, these uh, Financing rates are set on an annual basis, and so being that these rates are set on an annual basis, there is not uh, the notion of a trust fund in balance. Um, they are effectively annually set uh, to be in financial balance. And so there's not the same concerns of having adequate reserves um, in the SMI program as there is in the HI program. <coughs> Being that these programs are financed so differently, um, it's important to evaluate their financial conditions very differently, and I'll walk you through that in a moment. So we'll start with 2017 experience. So how did uh, the projections of what, was, what actually occurred in 2017 compare to what was uh, projected last year? Um, on the income side, you could see that there was, a, uh, for HI, uh, there was a significantly lower amount of payroll taxes uh, that were collected. Um, this was predominantly through uh, some of the assumptions uh, that our colleagues in the office of the chief actuary at Social Security, um, being that these programs are both financed on, <coughs> the, uh, on taxable payroll, um, our colleagues in the office of chief actuary are the ones that um, are the ones that project uh, the, the payroll tax, uh, payroll rates, payroll taxes, and the amounts that, of revenue that come into the various trust funds. Um, and as I understand it, there was some significant revisions uh, in how uh, the Bureau of Economic Analysis um, evaluated some uh, taxable payroll relative to GDP um, in, in prior years. And so the amount of actual uh, payroll taxes collected in 2017 um, was, was uh, significantly lower than what was uh, projected in last year's report. Um, you'll see this uh, coming through in some of the projections. Um, a lot of what the story is in terms of the changes with respect to the HI trust fund um, from last year to this year is really a revenue story. Um, and so I'll get into that a little bit more as we move forward. On the expenditure size, if you actually look at all of the expenditures for the HI, for the SMI, Part B, SMI, Part D, you could see that the expenditures were actually very close to um, what was projected in 2018, uh, based on what we now estimate what happened in 2017, um, was within 0.4%, um, up to 0.8% of what was projected. 
um, effectively, uh, 2017 was a good year to be a projection actuary. Um, so th that's really sets the foundation for how um, the uh, programs are evaluated moving forward. Um, this is the broader picture of, in terms of how the programs are financed. Um, and you can see that starting from the bottom, the tax on, uh, the, excuse me, the payroll taxes is uh, the most stable and predictable um, at, and, and fairly significant portion of the overall financing. You can see that that tax on uh, Social Security benefits is a growing uh, portion of the financing as we move into the long run. Um, and, and that's because some of the thresholds are uh, not indexed. Uh, at, 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 so um, then looking at the larger pieces up top, so that's really the HI funding um, together with the premiums um, and the general revenue, which is predominantly the SMI funding. Um, you can see that is a growing share. The general revenue, the fact that general revenues is a large and growing share, um, there is a provision in the law that requires, um, to the extent that general revenues exceeds 45% of total financing, um, that there is a Medicare, uh, there, there's a, a finding of excess general revenues. Um, and two consecutive findings means that there's a Medicare funding warning, which sounds very scary. Um, that Medicare funding is triggered this year. so there, uh, is a Medicare funding warning in response to the 2018 uh, report. That, all that means is that the president um, in next year's budget submission um, is to submit to Congress within 15 days of that budget submission uh, proposals that will address that situation. Um, and if you look at the top piece of the uh, funding is this deficit. And the deficit is that there is insufficient assets within the Part A, uh, the HI Trust Fund, and therefore, that's the amount of the shortfall that is currently not, at, not funded. Um, and we do not know how that will be funded. And so we'll talk about that a little bit as well. So when we evaluate the formal status, as I mentioned earlier, um, the fact that the programs are financed very differently means there needs to be a very uh, different evaluation of the trust funds. Um, for HI, uh, most importantly, are the assets plus projected income adequate to finance anticipated benefit costs? And on the SMI side, uh, the fact that the Part B and the Part D accounts are, are, are financed, are, 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 the determination of their financing rates are d done on an annual basis. They're automatically, on a, uh, they're automatically in financial balance. Um, there's no long-term solvency issues. But the fact that these are funded through general revenue transfers largely and through beneficiary premium rates means that there is uh, large and growing burdens on both the federal uh, treasury, um, so where our tax dollars go, um, as well as from the beneficiary perspective, um, a larger and growing share of retirement income, including social security income, um, is devoted to these programs. So this is tends to be the uh, slide or the information that gets the most attention from these reports. Um, you can see that uh, this is the ratio of the um, balance of the funds. And so it looks at the uh, balance that's in the, uh, in the trust fund as the beginning of the year as a ra ratio to the amount of expenditures uh, for that year. Um, the short range test is that uh, this ratio should be over 100%. Um, and as you can see, we've been under that uh, level for a number of years now. Um, as importantly, um, you can see that this ratio goes down to zero. Um, it is currently expected or projected that the uh, trust fund would uh, be depleted in 2026 this year. Um, and that is three years earlier than last year. Um, as I alluded to earlier, this is predominantly a revenue story. Um, the fact that, as I mentioned earlier, um, payroll taxes, the amount of revenue coming into the trust funds were um, lower in 2017, that also feeds into some future projections in that there are these lower ratios of uh, payroll to GDP in the near future. Um, as a result, there's less income coming into the trust funds, and therefore uh, the, the uh, depletion date is, um, is uh, shortened by about two years. Um, in addition, I uh, mentioned that there is the taxation on Social Security benefits. 
um, that is another uh, part of the um, income stream into the trust fund. The tax, uh, the tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 decreased um, individual uh, tax rates. And as a result, there is somewhat less uh, income coming into the trust funds um, over the next uh, you know, roughly seven or so years. Um, and so that has an effect um, on the revenue stream, and that does uh, have an effect on decreasing the uh, period of the trust fund, or making the trust fund depletion a year earlier. Um, on the expenditure side, certainly looking at the next 10 years or so when the, uh, in evaluating the, uh, the depletion date, um, there are some factors that increase expenditures over the next 10 years, and there are some factors that decrease expenditures over the next 10 years. Um, those roughly offset um, the, you know, some factors that lead to the increase in expenditures are things like higher Medicare Advantage payments, um, uh, projected Medicare Advantage payments. Um, there are uh, the, as part of the repeal of the individual mandate, um, there is expected to be uh, somewhat additional um, uh, higher uninsureds. And as a result of more uninsured individuals, uh, there's going to be higher uncompensated care payments uh, <coughs> to hospitals um, it, you know, through the HI program. Um, on the other side, there is a, uh, a slowdown in the expected uh, growth in inpatient utilization trends, um, which does uh, offset most of those increases. I think I walked through that. Um, so predominantly lower income, I think I hit all that. Uh, slightly higher expenditures, uh, got all that. Uh, and on the factors leading to lower expenditures, reduced provider utilization growth, as well as some lower economic assumptions used in the price growth. So there's a little bit of a price effect there as well. Taking a step back and not just looking at uh, the depletion date, there's also this notion of the 75-year actuarial balance. Uh, this looks at uh, the present value of future income and subtracts out the present value of uh, future costs. Um, this is all equated and put onto a taxable payroll uh, denominator. So it's the fact that taxable payroll comes down in most years does not have an effect on the income rate. Um, it could certainly have an effect on the cost rate. The fact that we are, are projecting lower revenues in the future um, means that both the, the amount of income coming in is lower as well as the taxable payroll base is lower. And so those two things roughly offset. So that you can see that there's not much of an effect on the income rate side. Um, on the cost rate side, you can see that there is a somewhat of an increase there. Um, again, that's largely a... Um, a revenue story, so we are getting less income, so effectively that denominator is a little bit lower. Um, there are, in the longer range, there are some uh, more upward pressure on expenditures, and that is mostly attributable to the repeal of the, uh, the IPAB, so the Independent Payment Advisory Board, um, was going to constrain some of uh, future cost growth, um, and the repeal of that um, does have some upward pressure on the cost rate. So this is the full picture of how that long range um, picture changes. So we had a uh, actuarial deficit of 0.64% last year. It's now 0.82%. Um, the different pieces that are presented here, the valuation period, the fact that we're taking out <coughs> a 2017, putting in 2092, um, just means that we are um, you know, shifting the period, sh shifting a relatively low cost year with a more high cost year. Um, so that just shifting the period has an effect. You can see that the largest effect is this base estimate, and those are two pieces that are included in, in that base estimate. The largest is that uh, revenue effect, so the fact that payroll taxes are lower um, in the uh, projection period. Um, that's roughly 0.13 um, of this difference, and you can see just putting out, uh, pulling out the 0.13 out of the 0.18 total change, um, that does explain the vast majority of, of the changes here. Um, the other base estimate uh, that's on the expenditure side, so we had uh, slightly higher expenditures in HI for uh, 2017, and so we build that into the projections. That has somewhat higher pressure there. 
the private health plan assumptions, that's, uh, there are some, slight, some higher uh, Medicare, advan Medicare Advantage payments uh, in this year's projection as compared to last year. Hospital assumptions, that's the slower rate of utilization growth that's uh, uh, put in there. Um, other provider assumptions, so not just the hospital, but other uh, uh, providers have some slightly slower um, growth rates. Other economic and demographic assumptions, the fact that the um, economic assumptions are a little bit lower, um, so not as fast growth uh, in uh, the price piece of uh, Medicare payments. Um, this legislative changes, um, the, the most significant piece here is the, um, the IPAB removal. Um, that, but there's also that uncompensated care piece is also um, a, a factor uh, in, in this legislative factor. So that, that's kind of the big picture in terms of walking through how the HI balance has changed from last year. So this is the picture of the uh, cost rate to the income rate. Um, you can see again, so we the cost rates are this. Uh, you know, the amount that's actually paid is the same as the cost rate up until 2026. In 2026, when the trust fund becomes depleted, the amount of revenue coming into the trust fund will still provide for a significant amount of benefits to be able to be paid. When the trust fund goes broke, it doesn't shut down and there's no ability to provide any services at that point. In 2026, the amount of income coming into the trust fund would actually be able to pay 91% of the benefits that are projected. And you can see that that uh, share of future income um, that, that's coming into the program uh, changes somewhat over time. In 2042, it drops down to 78%. In 2092, it's up to 85%. I think the important part to take away here is that um, the shortfall is not all of Medicare um, or, or all of HI shuts down. Um, it's that there's this gap between what's coming in and what needs to be paid out. Um, so you could imagine um, <coughs> many different ways that this could be addressed. Um, you can either uh, increase the income rates uh, by that actuarial deficit, so that the 0.82%, um, or alternatively, you could actually <coughs> reduce projected costs by 17%, and you would put um, the program in financial balance. Here you can see how these things changed uh, from last year. Um, and a little bit surprising, or as I mentioned before, when you change taxable payroll, you have less income coming in, but you're also changing the denominator by which we measure this on. And so there's not much of a, a change on the current law income rate. And you can see that that current law cost rate has increased somewhat, again, largely because of the payroll tax, uh, the, the, the taxable payroll change, um, but also because some of the uh, expenditures are projected to be higher. Um, as Joe alluded to in his introductory remarks, uh, there is an illustrative alternative projection. Um, this is uh, that basically to demonstrate that uh, long-range costs could be higher if certain cost reduction measures prove problematic. Um, the one that's most applicable for HI uh, are the productivity cuts that Joe alluded to. Um, and he did a very nice job summarizing that we think in the long range, uh, Economy-wide productivity would increase at roughly 1.1 percent, whereas we think healthcare productivity, um, historic based on historical experience, could only improve by 0.4 percent annually. That gap of 0.7 percent is not very big in any particular year, but when you uh, look out over 75 years, 0.7 percent each and every year adds up to a lot, um, and we'll show that in a minute. Um, on the physician side, I know we haven't talked about physicians yet, but uh, the illustrative alternative also um, a, a addresses the fact that um, price updates for physician uh, in every year in the future is specified. Um, and even if you were to take the higher amount of uh, the 0.75% per year uh, for those that are participating in alternative payment models, um, that's still well below what we think um, general inflation is, you know, CPI is much higher than 0.75%. It's much lower than what we think physician costs increase at e each and every year. And so whereas we don't have a, an SGR problem like we had um, a few years ago where there would be a one year 20, 25% cut, um, these are again, one, one and a half percent cuts each and every year. And you look out 
over several years, those add up fairly quickly. Um, and so the illustrative alternative just presents a scenario to demonstrate what the potential understatement is. Um, and, uh, and so the way it does that is the productivity transfers from instead of economy-wide productivity, but uh, to productivity that we assume that could be sustainable <coughs> within the health sector. And the physician's update uh, transition to the um, medical economic index, uh, which is a fair measure of, or we think is a fair measure of what uh, physician cost growth would be. And here you can see that pre previous slide, um, if you were actually to trend, uh, put on a line for what the cost rate would be under the illustrative alternative assumption is, um, you could see the effect of that roughly 0.7% per year. Um, it adds up to a lot when you look at over a number of years. Um, uh, turning to uh, SMI, part B, uh, there is not a huge story here. Um, you can see that we are very close to uh, the projections in this year's report are, are very close to what they were in last year's report. Um, there's slight upward pressure, um, mostly due to uh, the uh, Medicare Advantage uh, <coughs> issue that I, I mentioned earlier, as well as uh, some of the legislation, you know, removal of things like therapy caps have a somewhat upward pressure on uh, the short range Part B costs. Um, and, in the long range. Uh, Part D, though, there's a little more uh, activity here. So we can see here um, the projections for 2018 are much lower than what they were, um, certainly in the short range, uh, for uh, the prescription drug program than what was projected last year. And this is largely due to um, more rebates coming into the program. Um, that basically Part D plans are, duly, are, are, are negotiating more rebates uh, from manufacturers. Um, as well as a decline, and it's not something we usually see in any health program, a, a, a decrease in expenditures for a major uh, source of expenditures, um, a decline in the spending for hepatitis C drugs. That was a significant cost driver for a number of years. Um, that has actually reduced uh, in, in 2017. Um, similarly, there's been a slowdown in some uh, diabetes <coughs> drugs. Um, that has contributed to this slowdown in, in the short range. And so looking at this short range, uh, uh, looking at the change in the SMI program from the last year to this year, um, you can see that this year's report, um, very close in the, the current year's expenditures. You can see B is a little bit up, D is a little bit down. Um, in the longer range, uh, D is, is still down. That's uh, largely because of the issues that I, I mentioned earlier. B is up, um, and again, that's where we have the IPAB effect kind of bleeding in there, um, as well as uh, you know, some of the upward pressure that we mentioned in the short range that does carry forward um, into the long range. And so looking at the, the full picture, we are at 3.7% of GDP. Um, this is total Medicare expenditures as a, as a percentage of GDP. Um, in 2017, we are at 3.7%. Um, Looking out at the end of the projection period, it jumps up to 6.2% under cur current law. Um, and importantly, uh, the illustrative alternative, so it, it would grow to 8.9% under current law, uh, excuse me, under the illustrative alternative. So even if there wasn't the illustrative alternative as um, being problematic, even under current law, the 6.2% is still a significant uh, growth relative to where we are today. So this, um, I'm just gonna walk through these very quickly. This is looking at over the last several years of history and uh, for years into the future to see, this is kind of the, a, a smaller subset of the changes um, in the program that I, I started with. Um, and you can see here that the programs change pretty significantly even over a relatively short period of time. Um, you can see that the, uh, this is the share of uh, different services into the Part A program um, over time. And you can see that the share that was attributable to inpatient spending has decreased fairly rapidly um, in, in a relatively short period of time. So it started at, what is that, 77% drops down to, um, in the 60s, I can't see that far. Um, uh, and, and there has been a number of years of reduced um, inpatient spending um, within the, the Part A program, and obviously that's uh, 
controlled growth uh, in the inpatient setting is something that's projected to continue in the future. You can see that, should, and then on the top side of this, you can see that uh, you know some of those other programs are just making up more of a share. But that's really it's. This is really more of an inpatient story than um, anything else. Looking at Part B, um, you can see that uh, the physician payments have been declining over time uh, as a share of Part B. Um, <coughs> But the story here is that it's more a, a byproduct of outpatient becoming a more um, significant portion of the Part B uh, benefit. Um, and that could, is really a flip side of the inpatient story. So the fact that more services um, that previously might have been done in inpatient are now being done in an outpatient setting is having some different effects uh, across the Medicare program. And the last one, looking at the change of the benefit structure over, or, the, or the, the distribution of the benefits over time. Um, this one's pretty dramatic. The Part D benefit um, started out, and, and for a number of years, was a broad-based benefit that um, most of the benefit was going to um, a direct subsidy, which means that basically everyone that was part of the program was getting a benefit from. To the extent that that distribution has shifted into where most of the benefit is now catastrophic in nature. Um, the largest share of the Part D benefit um, uh, of Part D payments is going towards catastrophic payments. Um, and that is a significant shift over a very short period of time. Um, and I think the effects of this have not been uh, fully played out yet, but we'll, we'll see what happens um, in terms of how this program moves forward. But this, uh, <coughs> this is a byproduct of some very um, high cost drugs uh, being used by a relatively small number of beneficiaries, um, and it has really shifted the way uh, the Part D benefit has um, been utilized over time. And so, again, I've got, this is my fifth year here, so it's divisible by five, so that's important for some reason. Um, so how have the benefit, how has the projections changed over time? And starting with the taxable payroll, because really that is um, the biggest story this year, you can see that from 2013 through um, the end of this projection period, the amount of taxable payroll that's being projected in this year's report is substantially lower than what was projected um, you know, just five years ago. Um, this is mostly due to the, um, uh, the less ambitious recovery than what was in originally anticipated. The recovery has been going strong, but it just has not uh, shown up as strong as was originally projected certainly not as strong um, in terms of wage growth. And when you translate that into HI income growth, there's a pretty uh, direct relationship between those two. So you can see that the amount of income coming into the HI trust fund um, over the next several years, or certainly from where it was projected in 2013, is, fairly, is significantly lower than what it was otherwise. At the same time, the amount of uh, in pay, uh, the amount of spending in the program was also lower than anticipated. Um, there was a number of years of historic low growth um, in inpatient settings <coughs> and in other settings and uh, other uh, expenditures across the program. Um, and so this has led to reductions in uh, expenditure growth. And so what's the best way for an actuary to be wrong? Um, it's to be wrong on the income and wrong on the expenditures because that gets you to roughly the same place as we started. Um, so five years ago, the depletion date was projected to be in 2026, and we're still at 2026. Um, there are lots of reasons. There's more than just that general shorthand, and it's uh, probably unfair to take that shorthand, um, but I'll take it. Uh, <laughs> looking at the other programs, there's less uh, dramatics happening in the Part B and Part, or sorry, Part B. Um, you can see these projections are relatively close. The shocking part of this is that it is relatively close. Um, in this time, in 2013, we had the SGR program that was expecting to have a significant cut for physician payments. We replaced that with a completely different program. Um, but all in the same, the projections have not materially changed in the last five years. Um, on Part D, you could see that the trends, if you actually look back, if you just stop at, say, 2016, and say, oh, we're, we seem to be accelerating at a much faster rate. Um, that was really part of that, the hepatitis C exp, uh, expansion. And uh, 
the fact that we have now slowed down some uh, significantly on the hepatitis C, and the fact that there is this continued push towards generic utilization and slow down um, in, in some of the lower cost use. Um, while we are still seeing some very high trends in the very high cost, um, the fact that you know, we are uh, the vast majority uh, and growing um, uh, of drug uses in the uh, generic space um, has really uh, controlled the overall drug cost. And so we are actually much lower on the Part D spend than where we were many years ago, or five years ago. Um, the last slide I have is, um, so I took unfair credit earlier. Um, here is a place where we missed it. Um, so we looked at, in, this was in 2013, this is a projection of private, pre pretty much MA, um, health plan enrollment. We had assumed that um, the uh, payment reductions uh, to MA benchmarks that were being implemented as part of the Affordable Care Act um, would significantly <coughs> temper the uh, acceleration of Medicare Advantage enrollment, um, and that has not borne out. You can see that there is a very wide gap uh, between what we were projecting just five years ago and to what we are currently projecting in terms of Medicare Advantage enrollment. Um, there's a fair number of policy uh, approaches that were uh, adopted that kind of helped um, push some of that up. Um, and the ability for MA plans to, um, we'll say, accurately code um, or ex exuberantly code um, their uh, underlying risk score growth uh, has, has certainly contributed to um, the ability for plans to uh, not lose as much revenue as we originally an anticipated. Um, but just the attractiveness of the program um, continues to be extremely strong. And I think some of the panel members uh, might follow up on that conversation. So I think that is my slides. And so very good. Turn back to you, Joe. Uh, thank you very much. <coughs> um, you know, that last slide uh, reminds me to say that, of course, this is the trustees report. This is not Paul Spitalnik's report. And so in particular, uh, five years ago, the trustees at the time uh, had considerable influence. They don't necessarily dictate the assumptions, but they have considerable influence over the assumptions that are made. At least they have discussions uh, with uh, people who know the numbers. Uh, I, I will say that, um I will say that, uh, that the vast majority of the short-range assumptions are developed um, in the Office of the Actuary, and there's, um, we'll say, a, a good dialogue around some of those assumptions, ah, but dialogue. those assumptions are set by the Office of the Actuary almost exclusively. So, well, so uh, there's, there's probably less pressure than, than, or there might be pressure, but we are less receptive to the pressure or reactive ah, to that pressure. Very good. I feel much better about that. Bob, uh, take well, it back. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Joe, thanks for the invitation. I think this is a wonderful event. Uh, Paul, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, the Medicare Trustees Report, ladies and gentlemen, is a treasure trove of great information uh, for policymakers, <laughs> policy analysts, and the general public. Um, we're going to have a lot of substantive issues to talk about in the time that's left to us, but I I would be remiss if I did not mention two process issues, and I think uh, they are important. Uh, number one is the timing of this report. Uh, by law, the Medicare Trust Fund report is supposed to be presented to Congress on April 1st uh, each year. Uh, this is a statutory requirement. It's not a good idea or somebody's opinion or an administrative guideline. Uh, this is, in fact, what is supposed to be done. Uh, it is routinely late, whether it's a Republican administration or a Democratic administration, and that is a problem. Uh, the problem is, is that either the timing of the report means that, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the team does not have enough time to do all of the work, and the work is enormous, uh, to get done, uh, or some other reason. But nevertheless, I think we have to have Congress start to look into this. My own suggestion would be, that uh, perhaps uh, we have the uh, trustees report uh, at the end of the fiscal year. Uh, beginning in October then, uh, the president and his team can start to look at what could be done uh, and incorporate uh, the, um, the findings of the report into the budget submission that takes place usually in February of the following year. That's just a suggestion, but I think Congress has to look into that. The second process issue is that this report this year is signed only by Trump administration officials. This is a problem. 
Uh, the fact is we do not have uh, two public trustees. When um, the, um, the bipartisan um, National Commission on Social Security Reform issued its 1983 report, they remarked that adding two individuals from outside of the executive branch uh, would be good public policy and help to instill confidence in the integrity of the trust fund. Uh, so we, we really, mean, it really need uh, independent folks uh, outside of the Trump administration, outside of any administration, uh, to contribute to their assessment of the Medicare program. Uh, the current situation is simply not good public policy. And that means that the president and the Senate really should get on this. Uh, we can't leave this go uh, for another, another year. With regard to the 2018 <coughs> report, uh, Paul's uh, overview was comprehensive. I would, uh, my comment on this is that I don't think we're seeing here anything that would be a huge surprise. Uh, the trustees determined that uh, the trust fund uh, would become insolvent in 2026, three years earlier than last year. Um, and that it doesn't meet uh, the short-term or the long-term standards of financial adequacy. Well, in fact, the trustees have been saying that for years. And uh, I don't think there's any surprise here. By the way, incidentally, the Congressional Budget Office said a couple of years ago that 2026 was the year uh, that there would be insolvency in the Part A trust fund. Um, this has been going on year after year. I, I, I think in the media there's this unfortunate tendency uh, to focus on the HI trust fund without looking at the bigger picture. I think there's been an unwarranted obsession on this in the media. And politicians and pundits will use the term uh, scary language, you know, Medicare is going bankrupt or the Medicare trust fund is going bankrupt. Well, that is not a rational description of actually what is happening. The financial dynamics of the system or, or, uh, or it, that's not a realistic depiction of the financial dynamics of the system. Uh, the program, uh, the HI Trust Fund, hasn't gone bankrupt in the last half century, and I can't imagine that it will go bankrupt in the next uh, cent uh, half century. Uh, what this means, and I think it's an important point, is that Medicare has serious financial challenges. It's better to address them sooner rather than later, um, and uh, Congress is going to have to come to grips with this. I mean, this is not something that uh, is going to go away. Historically, Congress has addressed this by raising the payroll taxes. Since 1966, uh, we've raised the payroll taxes about 10 times. Uh, the other option is to uh, resort to payment reductions, basically, in uh, Medicare Part A. My concern about all of this is that I cannot imagine that after the scheduled payment reductions that are already baked into current law by the Affordable Care Act, uh, my understanding it's about $800 billion over the next 10 years, how Congress can actually continue to do this. And in fact, uh, if you look at the trustees' appendix, uh, the, uh, the language is pretty stark. Uh, Paul alluded to it, but it says, by quote, by 2040, Simulations suggest that approximately half of hospitals, roughly two-thirds of skilled nursing facilities, and over 80% of home health agencies would have total negative faculty facility margins, raising the possibility of access and quality of care issues for <laughs> Medicare uh, beneficiaries. Um, Medicare spending is accelerating once again, uh, so the solvency of the trust fund is only just one aspect of this. Joe pointed out the fact that the acceleration of the spending is eating up larger and larger chunks of uh, the gross domestic product. And between now and 2042, it will jump, uh, <coughs> Medicare will go from 3.7 to 5.9% uh, of the GDP. Um, and so whether you're talking about the alternative scenario or you're talking about the current law scenario, which uh, uh, the trustees have, have outlined for us, we're looking at a huge expansion of spending. Uh, CBO says that uh, over the next 10 years, spending will go from well over $700 billion to $1.4 trillion. Uh, it is the biggest, Medicare is the biggest driver of uh, health care spending. It dwarfs Medicaid, the ACA subsidies, uh, CHIP. And if current law remains unchanged, uh, federal spending led by Medicare will grow larger than any other federal spending category. 
today, federal spending amounts to about 28% of all non-interest uh, health spending. Uh, by 2047, it's going to reach 40% of all health spending. Um, <clears throat> we mentioned the impact on debt. Uh, the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission makes the point that with their reliance on general tax dollars and federal deficit spending, Medicare and other major federal health programs are going to have a substantial effect on the debt. Now, that all sounds very rough and, you know, suggests, you know, Congress and the president really have to get serious about this. But there is very good news here if we are careful and deliberate. Future debt, as the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission tells us, is very sensitive to even the slightest changes in Medicare and Medicaid per capita spending. So we can make modest changes and have a big impact in this area uh, as long as we do that. But the problem is if we don't do that, uh, we are going to be faced with very serious problems down the road. Uh, middle class entitlements are crowding out uh, other budget priorities. Um, uh, that's our biggest challenge, and Medicare is probably the biggest fiscal and managerial challenge. Uh, this is going to be very, very tough because middle class entitlements are the most popular. Americans love Medicare. Uh, if you look at any survey, you will get more than nine out of ten people say that they love Medicare, but the surveys also show, if you probe a little deeper, most Americans uh, haven't got a real clue about exactly how Medicare is financed, what it covers, what it doesn't cover and what the future projections really are and what it actually means for them uh, in the future. That's why, we, we, that's why we have these trustees' reports. The unfunded obligations of the program are getting bigger and bigger. Uh, the Medicare actuary uh, released uh, their unfunded obligations over the 75-year period. That's the benefits that are promised that are not paid for. And looking at the both scenarios, uh, under the current scenario, you're talking about 37.7 trillion dollars, and under the alternative uh, scenario, you're talking about 47.3 trillion dollars. No matter how you cut it, uh, young folks are going to have some very, very big bills to pay. Um, there's a lot to talk about. I don't want to take up too much time, but I would just simply say this: <sighs> public education is really critical here. Uh, people have to understand what the real trade-offs are. As I said, a lot of people love the program, but they are not absolutely clear in their own minds about what this will actually mean in terms of the, the impact of the current trends on both taxpayers and beneficiaries alike. Uh, the trustees uh, have given us a great, as I say, a great... Uh, uh, resource here uh, for further deliberations. I know what I would like to do. I mean, um, my preferences would be to simplify the program, combine Medicare uh, Parts A and Part B, add a catastrophic benefit, uh, make wealthier retirees pay more for their benefits, and perhaps phase out uh, the taxpayer subsidies for the wealthiest retirees, raise the age of eligibility. I think that would actually have a very, very good effect over the long term. And most importantly, change the economic incentives that uh, I think plague this program. What I would do is take the success that we've had with Medicaid Advantage, the defined contribution approach to financing, and expand it to the entire program. Now, I'm not under, I'm not under any illusion that any of this is going to be popular, but I think that's where we ought to go. Um, the need for reform, I think, is as is, is great as ever. Uh, the Medicare trustees, once again, as Joe pointed out, have said that this should be addressed urgently, you know, not, not later on, not down the road, urgently, by members of Congress and the administration working together. That would be a good idea. Uh, the Medicare trustees have done their job. Uh, it's time for Congress and the White House to do their job, and I'll make an ironclad prediction that in 2018... Nothing will happen. <laughs> Thank you, Joe, for the yeah, opportunity. It was, yeah. <laughs> it was more spirited, but equally depressing <laughs> oh, well, than me. We can work it out. Thank you. Steve, please. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank AEI for organizing this and Joe for inviting me to participate. 
I particularly want to thank Paul, not only for his presentation, but as he noted, for the extraordinarily important yeah. hard work that he and his colleagues do. Uh, from my perspective, when I was at CBO, I know how hard that business is, and it's really an invaluable public service. In my 10 minutes or so, I'm going to try to make a couple of brief comments about the baseline, which after Joe and Paul and Bob, I will try not to uh, repeat what the sage things they've already said, and then I'll cover four quick topics. Um, I think the summary of the situation is no surprise here, same as last year, just worse, <laughs> modestly. Uh, when I first got in the budget business, I asked somebody who had 38 years at OM OMB and its predecessor, the Bureau of the Budget, what do you think next year's budget looks like? And he said, same as last year, except worse. Uh, that seems to be a recurring theme here. I w what I'd like to do is try to widen the lens for a moment in talking about baselines. And if the good, you know, if the bad news headline, as Paul said, is that for the reasons he explained, the uh, insolvency date for the HI trust fund is three years faster, uh, but not much change in Part B and Part D. But um, the good news is those trust funds don't go insolvent. The bad news is we, as a country, are on the brink of insolvency. Uh, just to, uh, and as Joe and Bob and Paul have all echoed, um, there really are consequences to delay or degrees of freedom to be able to come up with ra rational policy solutions to align revenues and costs get dramatically reduced as time passes. A um, couple of quick facts just to, to again widen the lens. Picking up Joe's point, I think it's well known that the baby boomers are retiring on average 10,000 per day every day of the year. That is staggering. The uh, CBO recently reported that we have trillion dollar deficits as far as the eye can see that the, as a share of GDP, it's, slight, it's hovering around five percentage points of GDP, which is close to unprecedented levels, certainly on an ongoing basis. And where we really are in unprecedented and uncharted territory is where debt as a share of GDP will exceed 100%. I mean, we're, we are projected to go into debt higher than what we were at the end of World War II. That has really pretty staggering implications. So if, HI, if the SMI trust fund can't go broke, what it's relying on is a general fund, which is in very serious deficit. Uh, and just to put two more points of gloom and doom to uh, keep the theme of the panel, uh, healthcare cost growth has been low by historical standards. It could easily accelerate, and there are observers who believe it is accelerating. That would have, as Paul said, the sensitivity to this excess cost growth is enormously important. And I think it's fair to say that the uh, trustees report is on the optimistic side of the historic range. I mean, part of that is what goes on for, forever. What it, what's unsustainable can't go on forever, but the question is when does it stop? The other point, just to make some fiscal points, is that the threats are we're going to have demands for higher discretionary spending or for extending tax cuts that obviously ha either of those have deleterious implications for, for the budget. Uh, we're re highly sensitive to rising interest rates. And uh, I guess the rhetorical question is, when will the positive business cycle end? After nine years of a positive business cycle, when will we have a recession and what, what, what does that mean for our fiscal outlook? With that, let me try to quickly touch on uh, four points. The first, uh, Paul has already uh, highlighted on Part D, the major compositional change in, as Paul said in, in his slide showed, in, at the start of the program in 2006, 26% of the spending was projected to be for catastrophic. It's now projected to be 73%. 90% 90 per, 90 of scripts approximately that is nine out of every 10 prescriptions covered by Part D or generic, which has been a really enormous change. The, um, as Paul noted, the growth of a restricted number of drugs, what are typically called high cost or specialty meds, and now accounts for the bulk of spending. And that trend is 
I think, continuing and maybe be ex arguably accelerating. And the last thing I would note is that, again, a piece of recent legislation, uh, the Affordable Care Act filled in the so-called donut hole for, and for brand drugs. It had pharmaceutical manufacturers paying half the cost, beneficiaries paying a quarter, and health plans paying a quarter. That, it, that has now shifted in that beneficiaries are still responsible for 25% of the cost, but health plans are picking up 70% and health, sorry, pharma companies are picking up 70%. Health plans are now down from 25 to 5%. And I would just observe that I, it would surprise me greatly if the amount of rebates they collect on that spending don't exceed their 5% liability. <coughs> that has some interesting implications for how the program evolves. Uh, the other point, and I'll just do this very quickly, is the uh, administration recently announced its blueprint on drugs. In the interest of time, I won't bother going through the details. I'll just give you my takeaway, which is that it's not going to do anything about the high cost of drugs. Um, the, uh, let me quickly mention a couple of challenges for, for fee-for-service. Um, Bob mentioned uh, MedPAC. Uh, MedPAC reports, I believe, that... Uh, on the Medicare line of inpatient business, the uh, hospitals are losing, and there's obviously distribution around this average, but are losing almost 10%, 9.6% is the negative margin. Uh, as, as Steve will get to, that has some interesting implications if one wanted to expand the number of people who are covered under Medicare. Um, we've already heard a lot about the uh, question about the sustainability of the ongoing productivity cuts and their implications for access and quality. Those are really important things and I won't <laughs> spend any time on it other than to underscore my agreement. Um, some emerging policy issues or ongoing policy issues are Medicare has, still has a significant site of service differential issue which has the effects of driving independent physicians into hospitals uh, and some as well as other issues driving consolidation. <coughs> the, we've already heard about the MAC, the, issues of macro and whether um, the limited updates or the uh, fee-for-service, what's called the MIPS program, whether that is viable. And I think one could seriously question the viability of either of those. And then the big question is, will alternative payment me methods or APMs actually work and will they work for both providers and Medicare as well as for beneficiaries? The, um, if I could just kind of summarize what are the challenges for fee-for-service Medicare? It's what does the future look like? Is it this brave new world where we have this miraculous uh, emergence of alternative payment methods and bundled payments and value-based pay payment? Or is it very much look like the status quo where what we're doing is very much uh, fee-for-service where we're rewarding volume? The um, I want to briefly touch on something that I think Steve Zuckerman will spend, uh, hope, I hope will spend a fair amount of time on. He and his colleagues have written an excellent report that I would commend to everybody um, that um, talks about uh, ways to expand Medicare. I just want to make two quick points here. One is it's well known that on average Medicaid rates are way below Medicare rates for hospitals and that and I'll just stay with hospitals to keep this simple, and that commercial rates are well above Medicare. So just to illustrate the effects of redistribution and winners and losers, if we expand the number of people who are covered by Medicare, whose payment rates are dictated by Medicare, imagine that you have two hospitals, each of which has 35% of their patients are Medicare, but for the remaining 65%, they're mirror image opposites. One is 50% commercial and 15% Medicaid versus 50% Medicaid and 15% commercial. In that case, if we simply were to move everybody to pay Medicare and very, make it very simplified, clearly the hospital that had a heavy commercial presence would lose a lot of top line revenue and a hospital that had a very heavy Medicaid presence would lose a lot of, it would gain a lot of revenue. Um, the second point I would make is what in CBO speak we would call political economy. The more <coughs> people are being paid at Medicare rates, 
the greater the incentives are for special interests to affect those rates. And so that the lobbying and so on will become even more intense as we expand Medicare. And I look forward to Steve's discussion about these points. Last thing I want to do is I'm going to conclude by talking about Medicare Advantage, which, as Paul in his slide showed, that we're currently at a little over 21 million Medicare enrollees who are in Medicare Advantage. And that's about almost 36% of all beneficiaries in 2018. And the trustees project that that will increase to 29 million at the, in 2027, at the end of 10 years. And that's almost 39% of beneficiaries. Um, again, showing why it's important to read the footnotes in the trustees' report. And uh, I'm going to digress for a second. I would recommend that everybody take a look at page 254 of the trustees' report, which is Paul's very elegant uh, statement of actuarial opinion. And the second paragraph is a very adroitly worded but very chilling picture <laughs> about the viability of current law. Uh, it's not quite, it's very politely saying there's some fire out there and you better be prepared. But anyway, getting back to this, if you look at the footnote, it turns out that, um, that we're at 39.2% of those beneficiaries <coughs> who have full Medicare, that is, beneficiaries who have both Part A and Part B. 39% of them are currently enrolled, not 36%. So details matter, and, and I commend the, the trustee, Paul, for being very clear about this. But we're at almost two out of every five people currently who are fully insured or in Medicare Advantage. I will stop by saying that Joe and four colleagues and I have a paper on uh, that was published in May, uh, May 10th, I guess, on health affairs and links to a white paper at Brookings. Uh, where it's, there's a lot more detail and, and, and analysis on ways to reform Medicare Advantage and to make the, the rate-setting process look like Part D. Um, and I will not spend much time on that because otherwise I will go over time. But we estimate that if we adopted the Part two things, the Part D-like bidding structure, and we also standardized plans we propose to have uh, restrict Medicare Advantage organizations to three offerings, two of which would be absolutely standard in a region, third of which would, would, would permit innovation uh, or innovative benefits, that we think the, the uh, behavioral economics literature suggests that that would go far to improving consumer choice and, making, and make it easier for people to make smart decisions. Uh, our estimate is that on a steady state basis, that'll save about $10 billion. With that, thank you, and I look forward, Steve, to your discussion. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to, uh, to this session. As, as Joe knows, when uh, Joe knew when he, when he called me up, I'm not necessarily someone that scours the Medicare trustees report every year. So this was a unique opportunity for me, and I'm going to probably direct my comments less towards the Medicare trustees report, and as you've heard, towards a... Um, towards an idea that uh, my colleagues Linda Blumberg and John Hollihan and I have uh, put forward uh, that builds on some of the, the, um, Medicare, the, the growth in Medicare Advantage. Uh, so the one thing I am going to start by just saying is that I think Paul explained something that was a little confusing to me when I, when I read the report about a lot of the, uh, moving, the moving up of the... Um, depletion date of the health insurance trust, uh, the hospital insurance trust fund uh, moving up three years relating to payroll taxes. That seemed a little bit confusing, but it sounds like uh, there's now a greater recognition that the recovery, in fact, has not been as robust as people thought it would be, and uh, payroll taxes have not gone up. The other, things I, the other thing I found interesting is that when you look at the lower taxes on Social Security benefits, uh, some of the bump maybe that, there's, that, that has occurred in hospital spending. Uh, Steve talked about you know, the issues about uh, hospitals getting, being able to get facility fees for outpatient services, <coughs> the potential impact of eliminating the ACA mandate uh, on uh, leading to more uninsured individuals and growth in dish payments, and the Medicare Advantage system and the payment models that are used and the risk adjustments and the quality, it's sort of a little bit of at the margin, government inflicted damage to the hospital insurance trust fund. And I think that that's, that's just something to keep in mind. 
And at the same time, IPAB, which may or may not have worked very well, was taken out of the game. So if there was anything that was going to put brakes on, on payments, uh, that's not there now. Now, the reality is that history tells us that action has always been taken, whether it's higher payroll taxes, reduced provider payments, um, to keep the, the hospital insurance trust fund solvent. And I have no doubt that that's going to continue to happen. I think it's important, and I think it's been alluded to about when people talk about access issues, to keep in mind that Medicare is part of the broader healthcare system. And generally speaking, Medicare has done a little bit better job of controlling spending per beneficiary than private health insurers. So I think that you have to, you, you have to really take a broad, broad look at this and um, not just stay focused on the Medicare program per se. Um, so I am going to now say a little bit more about Medicare Advantage. Clearly, Medicare Advantage <coughs> in recent years has been thriving. I mean, the Affordable Care Act reduced payments for Medi to Medicare Advantage plans, and the expectation was that enrollment in those plans would go down because plans didn't have the opportunity to provide extra benefits. CBO, the actuaries, everyone was <coughs> flat out wrong. Since payments were cut in the Affordable Care Act, Medicare Advantage enrollment has grown dramatically. It's now about a third of the program. So even though Congress and the administration may not be taking efforts to really reform the Medicare program radically, beneficiaries are doing that. Why are they doing that? Probably because in a lot of areas of the country, Medicare Advantage plans are being overpaid. Uh, there's been issues about risk, risk adjustment in Medicare Advantage leading to higher payments. Uh, it's, there's quality bonuses in the program that may or may not be tied to research suggesting that those higher quality plans actually are better for beneficiaries. So I think there's a lot of issues around Medicare Advantage payment that need some reconsideration. One aspect of Medicare Advantage that I think is very important to recognize is that private plans can come into the program and successfully compete with traditional Medicare <coughs> because those private plans are using the prices that traditional Medicare sets. So they're using regulated prices. They're not paying commercial payers, uh, you know, they're not paying like commercial payers 190% of costs uh, to hospitals for care. And that, that, those regulated prices for physicians, for hospitals, for other services that, that Medicare Advantage plans can draw on allows them to compete with the traditional fee-for-service side of Medicare. So seeing that, my colleagues and I thought that, well, there may be something there, and I understand, as, you know, as Steve Lieberman pointed out, that um, there's some risk to Medicare prices getting used broadly in the healthcare system and providers saying, wait a minute, we can live with Medicare prices when we can charge commercial plans much, much higher rates than that, but if more people um, get Medicare prices. And I think that that's probably one of the reasons that Medicare for all, that a lot of people talk about, uh, may be a little bit of a non-starter, because I think it could be a very big shock to the system. So as, as we were thinking about Medicare Advantage and the Affordable Care Act, we could see strengths and weaknesses to both, both programs. And you could see the success of the Affordable Care Act. Clearly, since the coverage provisions went in effect in 2014, uh, access to coverage, affordability has really increased. Um, the non-group market has increased risk sharing. You're not getting this underwriting. Uh, you, you haven't seen, as some people were concerned about, a crowd out of employer coverage. Um, no significant decline in employment, jobs have not been lost, and spending growth has been restrained in the overall system. But the Affordable Care Act was not as successful as it could be. One problem with the Affordable Care Act's design is that the Supreme Court allowed the Medicaid expansion, which was the foundation of the Affordable Care Act, to become an option for states. 
So states, uh, you know, right now, it's a little hard to count given all the uh, maneuvering around, but about 17 to 18 or 18 states have not expanded Medicaid. Marketplace enrollment has been low in some areas. Premiums have been high and rising. So premiums have definitely been an issue in Medicare, in the Affordable Care Act marketplaces. And there has been discretion, both in the Obama administration on how the law was implemented, and that discretion is carrying through into the Trump administration as to how much support there is for outreach, enrollment assistance, and there may be, it may be a time, and this is kind of where we're coming at with, with this paper that we wrote, there may be a time to be thinking about something broader than just fixing the Affordable Care Act. So, as I say, uh, Linda Blumberg, John Hollihan, and I have presented uh, what we're calling, because we didn't kind of think of a better brand name, the Healthy America Program, but we're happy to have this program have another name, you know, if anyone would like. Um, and it's really a comprehensive reform that would get closer to universal coverage. We think it would increase affordability and access to care, increase cost containment, while really limiting dis the disruption of a Medicare for all type approach and not lead to huge increases in government spending. And we built, as I said, on aspects of the Medicare Advantage program and the Affordable Care Act marketplaces. And one of the things that we did, which I think for some people seems a little bit probably controversial, is that we would integrate Medicaid acute care. So we would bring Medicaid acute care and CHIP into the non-group market. So they would all, uh, so benef medi current Medicaid beneficiaries and people currently purchasing in the non-group market would all be choosing from the same set of plans. We would not do anything to the employer market, even though I really understand all the problems with the tax exclusion of employer contributions to premiums, and I'm not a fan of them. We would leave that aside, untouched, and we'd leave Medicare as it is also. Sorry, even though I know it needs reforms. That the, you know, the Medicare cost-sharing cost structure could be modified, but we didn't touch that. We're not touching the VA, TRICARE. So we're kind of FEHBP, the Indian Health Service. And our idea is to develop sort of a Medicare Advantage style marketplace with a public plan that would be fee for service, just like traditional Medicare, but also have private insurer options as you have in Medicare Advantage. Um, we would cap. Medicare provider payment rates within that marketplace um, at Medicare rates. So both inside and out, out of networks, that's all that could be, that's all that providers could receive. We would improve premium and cost sharing assistance. So now there's a big concern about, well, if you're not eligible for tax subsidies at over 400% of the federal poverty level, you're exposed to these really high premiums. We would just go right up the income distribution you know, as far as you want, no one would have to pay more than 8.5% of their income for, t towards premiums. Uh, we would probably keep the individual mandate, maybe restructure it a little bit. Uh, so instead of having a tax penalty, uh, we would probably have it more as some of the expansion of the, uh, the, the um, standard deduction would be at risk if you, if you remained uninsured. And you could then, if you became insured, recover that the next year. So, I mean, I think we, we're sort of not calling it an individual mandate, but I recognize the fact that it's an individual mandate in, in one form or another. And, you know, we think it's less aggressive. This is a pr an approach that's less aggressive than single payer and maybe a little bit more politically feasible. We would have a very large marketplace We've done some modeling of this. We would have 117 million people in the marketplace. So insurers would see a large group of people and participate in the program. About 69 million would be former Medicaid. There'd be about 16 million newly insured. There would be some people coming from ESI. We would allow people, even if they have what's considered an affordable offer under the Affordable Care Act, to move into uh, the marketplace. There would not be a firewall. 
and continuing the uh, non-group coverage. We wouldn't get to universal coverage. We'd still have about 18 million people remaining uninsured. About 8 million of those would be undocumented immigrants who would not be uh, eligible for the program. Um, financing, I won't go into a lot of details because I want to leave time for questions, but there, we would have continued state maintenance of effort. We think federal costs would increase by about $98 billion. <laughs> Employers would save some money. Uh, households would save some money. And yes, the expansion of Medicare rates, providers might lose a little bit relative to the marketplace, the current marketplace rates, but that would be offset by increases in payment rates for all the Medicaid people that would be going into, the, into these new plans. So I will stop there with, you know, maybe a bright, new, bright news building off the Medicare program. Uh, at, that's extremely depressing, Steve. <laughs> uh, yeah, a, a little more politically feasible uh, for... Uh, some administration that is not currently in place. And, well, you know, this is, you know, this is an evergreen and, and, proposal. And, We're willing to let it uh, sit but, on the vine for but, a couple you know, of years is, and write it. But, you it's a kind of thing that politicians do all the time, right? Uh, okay. they, they, they sell the sizzle, uh, but uh, there is no stake. Uh, and, and in particular, I think the trustees' report, and, and especially the, the alternative <laughs> scenario, <coughs> illustrates the problem. Uh, if, you, if you can't... If you can't make the current system work, the current set of price controls work, then throwing another 100 million people into the system, uh, it's, not, it's not a little nick. Uh, it's, a, it's a big nick. Now, uh, the question really boils down to uh, 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 kind of like w wage and price controls for physicians. You didn't really say that, but that's what we're really talking about. Most of the, a lot of their business comes from Medicare beneficiaries, not surprisingly. Uh, Medicare beneficiaries are at that age where they they need, they need more services, uh, and so and so uh, really uh, this kind of a proposal, which I agree with you to some extent that, that it's it's more thought out politically than you know most of the other Medicare for all uh, ideas, but nonetheless you're talking about a very politically important but economically important and in, in terms of healthcare. It, uh, extremely important group of providers who basically would have to take a gigantic uh, hit. Now, what's the right, the question always is, what's the right price? What should we be paying, paying people for? Uh, I don't know what the answer to that is. You know, I think Thomas Aquinas uh, couldn't answer that one either. Uh, but, but, uh, uh, but the fact is that you have to start from where you are. And where we are is a very different world than the, than the world that I think you're, you're suggesting. Okay, one, I, I just think one comment about provider, about provider payment. I think that providers would like to tell you or like to convince payers that the way they are structured in terms of their costs, their expenses, are something that is something that's immutable. And we know that that's not immutable. Providers can adapt to different payment rates and, in fact, do. And this is something that, you know, uh, there was a comment before about, you know, some of the productivity incentives, uh, you know, are not really likely to be reflecting the productivity gains that are possible. But I think that these productivity incentives, I always see as sort of a nice way of saying we're putting pressure on providers to change the way they do business. And... That's, is in a sense, what the Medicare payment cuts are generally. Certainly, going back, and, you know, I have to admit, I remember when inpatient prospective payment came into place. I remember when it didn't have to be called inpatient because it was the only prospective payment system. Uh, providers changed radically. They moved more care to outpatient services. They reduced length of stay. So I think that the idea that the system can't change, I mean, we know that when people look at comparisons between U.S. healthcare spending and international health and spending in other countries, that prices, the high prices in the U.S. system are at the heart of the high spending we're having. We're not willing to take that on. We're not going to solve the spending problem. Well, would anybody else like to comment? 
Well, the only thing that I actually agree with uh, Steve on is... Uh, I'm surprised there was anything. <laughs> no, there is. Uh, but it's a very, very rare, <laughs> it's a rare moment. Uh, but, I, you know, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned uh, one of the great distortions of the existing uh, health care system, which is the federal tax treatment of health insurance, uh, the exclusion. And, I, you know, I've always felt, you know, that if, you know, Uwe Reinhardt and Henry Aaron and Stuart Butler and, uh, and Jim Capretta and all those guys could actually get together and agree to take that on, that we would actually be far ahead of where we are now. Uh, I remember talking with the late Uwe Reinhardt, who made the comment that, the, believe it or not, that the heritage proposal to establish a national tax credit system was, in fact, the most progressive um, agenda ever offered. Uh, you know, at that during that period of time in the early '90s. The thing is, is that uh, you know the the power of you know organized opposition. Uh, to this kind of a change uh, has created, I think, uh, an awful lot of problems to the point where, you know, we ended up with the Affordable Care Act largely because people who lost their jobs and changed jobs did not have health insurance. They had to buy the health insurance uh, uh, with after-tax dollars on an individual market that was, in fact, not functioning. And uh, as you know, from the economic literature, if you uh, buy health insurance without tax relief on an individual market basis, you could pay anywhere between 25 and 50 percent more for the same package of benefits that you would have gotten at the place of work. I believe that sometime, at some place, somewhere, <laughs> sounds like West Side Story, <laughs> there's a place for us, <laughs> that we'll actually arrive at some kind of uh, an agreement. I don't see that happening now, and I certainly don't th see uh, the, uh, the Trump administration adopting anything even close to what you're imagining. No. Yeah. We don't, we, we've said to many people, we don't see a congressional no. vote in the, in the, yeah. on the horizon. Yeah. Yeah, Steve. Um, I think this discussion illustrates, in part, the complexity of health care. Oh, yeah. I mean, Joe, your observation about an incomes policy, Steve, I don't know what the current estimate is, but I, my guess is more than 70% of health care spending essentially is incomes, or labor. And so if you're cutting provider revenue, you're cutting people's wages. Um, I'm reminded of what a partner of mine when I was running healthcare in, of all places, Arizona, who had started, a family practice doc who had started the first HMO in Arizona said, in fee-for-service, physicians are revenue centers. In capitation, they're cost centers. And that explains a lot of behaviors. I think we all agree that economic incentives matter. Joe's, your point about how do you get the price right is extremely important. Uh, I think Steve and his colleagues deserve enormous credit for a very carefully thought out proposal, but it requires a whole lot of uh, incremental improvements towards the second best at, as an optimistic statement. Yeah. And just to conclude, I remember running healthcare in San Diego in the mid-90s, which had the distinction of either the lowest or second lowest capitation rates in California. And the market had changed very dramatically in five years from being predominantly fee-for-service to predominantly capitated. And I had a group of family practice docs that I managed, and they were unhappy with their capitation. And physicians are very practical problem solvers and most of them want to be at the head of the class. Every Friday afternoon, the head of that group came into my claim shop and reviewed every single referral of a service that went outside of his group. And I won't say they stinted on care, but they scared the hell out of my medical director and me. We have to be careful what we wish for. And I think, Steve, as you acknowledge, the good news from a budgetary perspective is Medicare rates are a lot lower than commercial rates and also a lot higher than Medicaid rates. Um, how you get that roughly offsetting or a savings is an interesting question. I think you, you and your colleagues have done an impressive work in that. But this is a very tough issue, and it comes back to be careful what you wish for, because if you don't have the price right, very clever people figure out how to, as with Medicare Advantage, game the system to their advantage. 
So many, many of the changes that could be considered, you know, are no doubt, and this is one, you know, we all understand in this room that healthcare is complicated. And if you talk about ideas such as a defined contribution, let's say going in the direction of premium support in Medicare, the issues around risk adjustment that plague Medicare Advantage will be even more important in, in that kind of a situation because then traditional Medicare is going to, would, would end up being risk adjusted. If you talk about raising the age of eligibility for, for Medicare, then you have to think about what is the implications of that, assuming the ACA stays in place, for the ACA marketplaces. So there's, there's a lot of domino effects here that, that, that happen. Yeah, but look, we, we did a lot of price regulation, you know, beginning in the 1980s. Uh, you mentioned the prospective payment system. We adopted that. Now, that was designed, if I recall correctly, uh, Joe, you were there in the Reagan administration. When we, we did that in the Reagan administration. The idea was to introduce some kind of market discipline right. into hospital pricing. And all the good intentions were there to restrain you know, the growth of these prices. You'll recall that, you know, the, the Carter administration was talking about hospital cost containment, basically a, a comprehensive price control system for hospitals throughout the country. Didn't go anywhere. But the point is, when we did that, one of the first big effects of that was a massive cost shift from inpatient uh, to outpatient. So we had, you know, they pressed down the balloon, and then we found ourselves with an explosion of outpatient cost. And it was not surprising that, you know, throughout the rest of the 1980s, um, the uh, actuaries uh, at CMS and, and the Reagan administration conservatives were, you know, basically sweating blood over the question of what we're going to do about the explosion in Part B cost. Uh, and we ended up, of course, creating uh, this resource-based relative value scale that looks like it was imported out of East Germany. And uh, we imposed that on the system in 1989. And now, a lot of folks are looking back at that and saying, you know, uh, really, there, uh, there's the, the bloom has basically faded on that rose. And we're back, to, uh, met, yeah, we're back to this whole idea of trying to you know, redo physician payment again. And now we've got something that looks like it's collapsing, uh, which is uh, the Medicare payment program that was enacted by Congress in 2015 uh, to the point where the, the MIPS proposal is... The Medicare Advantage or the Medicare Commit Payment Commission saying we should get rid of it. So, you know, <coughs> this whole idea that we are going to set the right price seems to me to be the problem. I don't think, frankly, that we can all design the right price for all of these complex procedures, especially 8,000 procedures for physicians. <coughs> there is, of course, the market. We haven't had a market in a long time in healthcare. We may not get one. Uh, from my point of view, we ought to do everything we possibly can to intensify competition and create a market, but also to establish some kind of a level playing field, which we do not have in the current health care system. Sure. If I, if I can make uh, one. Very quickly. Yeah. We have to go to the very, my comment would be I take a different lesson from the creation of the effective <coughs> payment system, which was what motivated it was anything but TEFRA. People wanted to avoid the cost reports. The only reason I'm the only reason I'm mentioning that is, out of the crisis, out of the shortfall in the HI funding and so on, that may become an impetus for action. Well, look, let me let me make a, a point that's a little less uh, requires a, a, a little less uh, knowledge of uh, ancient history, uh, <laughs> which which is that uh, the kinds of policies that that. Uh, <clears throat> the generic Medicare for all people talk about and, and that Steve's analysis addresses uh, uh, rely on uh, kind of the average price level. They don't worry about the distribution. <coughs> it's a point that Bob is making as well uh, with, with regard to physician payment. Uh, I, think, I think no one can disagree that uh, moving unnecessary admissions out of the hospital and having people uh, go to the proper site of service at the proper level of care is a good thing. So uh, <coughs> having a shift from A to B in the abstract is a good idea. How you do that is the problem. Uh, and I don't think <coughs> that any of these general kinds of proposals have addressed that at all. By the same token, 
uh, the, the trustee's report also has that s same character. It's a very aggregate kind of an explana <coughs> pardon me, explanation. And so <coughs> you're not going to find the so policy solutions there. You're only going to find the scary thing that you already knew 20 years ago. That's not a bad thing, but there's a lot more work to do in policy. So with that, uh, it, can we have a question from the audience? Uh, Peter, first. Uh, wait. Uh, for the uh, microphone, and please identify yourself. Hi, I'm Dr. Peter McMenamin, uh, health economist, former HICFA person, and recently retired from the American Nurses Association. The, uh, <coughs> when I was working for the Nurses Association and, and making projections about the effects of the Affordable Care Act, I had an argument that two to three million people would age into Medicare for the rest of the century, and I was challenged on that by Henry Aaron. So I talked to former colleagues who were with the actuary's office. I got the projected age in numbers specifically. Henry was right, <coughs> I was wrong, but my numbers were too low, not too high. We already are at 3 million people aging in per year, and actually we're not at 10,000 a day. That doesn't happen until uh, 2019, <coughs> but for the boomer generation, the average is 10,000 a day. What happens, and the reason that the, there's a projected slowdown in the rate of growth of the aged population, is that uh, the boomers are going to die. Um, and the deaths will catch up and overtake the agents uh, towards the middle of the century. And because of the increase in deaths, um, the actuaries, I believe, have that figured in, but I don't think anyone has really contemplated what having more than double the number of deaths per year in this country by 2088 uh, it will affect hospital operations, the market for uh, 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 funerals, that sort of thing. In the 2020s, <laughs> Because of the increase in deaths, and assuming that one-third of deaths occur in hospitals, which is the historical average, the number of people dying in American hospitals per year is going to go back to more than a million per year. Hasn't been that high since 1982. The hospital <laughs> finances, I suspect, are going to be affected because all of these people will be in their last year of life, they will, many of them, be in hospitals. My recollection is that it used to be 46% of hospital revenues came from CMS. Uh, it could go to 60 or more. I suspect that will have a, an effect on them. So it, it, for doom and gloom, the average age of the, of the Medicare population when we get to 2026 is still less than 80 but the increase in deaths will accelerate after 2026, and I think it's going to stir up things. Whether you know the the trust fund is in balance or not. Right. Yeah. Certainly uh, true. I I think I detected some investment advice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> by funeral uh, homes. By funeral <laughs> homes. Yeah. Uh, uh, but, but, but 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 more broadly. <laughs> more, but more broadly, uh, what you're saying is. Uh, 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 that uh, the whole nature of the healthcare system is going to have to change. <coughs> it's not just because it's just not just because there won't be enough bodies to fill the beds. It's because that isn't going to be a sensible way to deliver healthcare. Uh, then it probably isn't a really sensible way to deliver healthcare now. And we are not even talking about the fact that they may not be dying in hospitals. They may be dying in nursing homes that Medicare doesn't get right. involved with. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me let me make another observation on this, I, Peter. I think you've got to, you know, I think we all have to worry about, you know, the explosion of hospital costs. <clears throat> but there's never, <coughs> as as we all know, healthcare is complicated, and a lot of different things can happen. There is a there's a general dissatisfaction uh, in the United States with end of life care. Uh, if you look at the survey research I have, and uh, you ask people. What would you, for you, what would you prefer? And um, people say, well, I would like to die at home. 
I would like to be sure that I'm comfortable, that my family's around, and we'll have the opportunity to die at home, like our grandparents did routinely. Um, instead, overwhelmingly, people are dying in hospitals, oftentimes in ICU units and so on. There is in Medicare the hospice benefit, and the hospice benefit is a wonderful thing about... Um, I forget exactly what the number is, but it's a large number of people are starting to take advantage of that. The good news is that more people are starting to die at home. And I think that if, as far as public policy is concerned, one thing that we certainly can do in Medicare uh, is to <laughs> encourage perhaps a, a new benefit, a palliative care benefit. It's not necessarily hospice, but palliative care that would guarantee people an option to take advantage of the services that are now in Medicare Part A and Medicare Part B. The problem with it is it's a very fragmented care. It's very disjointed. But we would, if we created such a benefit, uh, we would have the opportunity to develop a different <laughs> care delivery for these people who, the massive number of baby boomers, who are going to be, by the way, very disappointed to find out that they, too, are going to die. So... You know, but we could probably we could probably actually reduce costs in, in the uh, toward the end of life. Right, yeah, right. That's the, that's the critical thing. Well, it's twenty five percent of the total adding, cost. Adding a right? new benefit isn't necessarily the answer to much of anything, unless there is a shift towards a more efficient. Yeah, system. because right now twenty five percent of the total cost. We've, we've, run, are, we've run out of time. <laughs> I'm sorry. sorry. We we and we have to stop now because uh, of uh, uh, our uh, uh, other viewers outside the room. Uh, so please join me in uh, thanking the panel for an interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you.